Well, good afternoon. Welcome to, my gosh, is it August already? The August edition of our Draper Natural History Museum Lunchtime Expeditions. Really happy to have you here, braving the smoke outside and everything. We knew it was a matter of time, didn't we? It was going to come, and when those winds shifted, uh, we're getting it all for a while. But it's part of uh, living in the West these days. Um, let me, um, uh, first of all, just make a couple of announcements. One is uh, your mobile devices, if you just switch those off or to vibrate at this stage to avoid any noise in the middle of things. That would be great. Another, I always forget this and leave it till the end while everybody's leaving, so I'll announce it now. Um, we have our second Draper After Dark presentation uh, coming up on August 13th um, on uh, what night? Is, is that a Thursday night, Bonnie? Do you remember? A Thursday night. Uh, double check that one though, but August 13th. I think actually that may be, uh, let's see, 11th is Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So probably a Monday evening, I'm not sure. We'll double check on that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, Brian Rutledge will be here from Audubon's Rockies um, to tie in with uh, you know, what we're talking about with Monarch of the Skies, as does actually our presentation uh, today. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am uh, Chuck Preston, Senior Curator of the, of, uh, the Draper Natural History Museum. Um, and uh, I want to thank a couple of our important Draper staff members here today. Bonnie Smith, of course, who coordinates all of our educational program, including the, the two lecture series. Um, and Corey Anko is here somewhere. He's helping record today uh, the, uh, uh, the talk. And, and you will be able, we've been recording now the last several. We've finally been able to do that, thanks to Corey, over the last, uh, this last season. So we'll have those available for you um, to view the, uh, the recordings here in the future. I also want to thank, of course, the, the Nancy Carroll Draper uh, Charitable Foundation and Sage Creek Ranch for helping support our lecture series and programming in general here at the uh, at the center. So with that, let me introduce our guest. I'm really pleased. I uh, haven't seen him in a while, actually, but he's been a, a friend to the Draper and to the center uh, for an awfully long time. He's a world-renowned figure in archaeology, particularly on rock art. Currently, he's president of Sacred Sites Research Incorporated. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and protection of American pictograph and petroglyph sites. Between 1995 and 2008, he was research professor at the University of New Mexico, fo focusing much of his research at that time in the Pinion Canyon maneuver site at Fort Carson, Colorado. It turns out we have tread a lot of the same ground, Larry. <laughs> we talked at lunch today and then uh, uh, spent a lot of time in Pinion Canyon as well. He was an integral member of the international team chosen to excavate the Chauvet Cave, uh, discovered in southern France in 1994. He's a native of Montana uh, and is known for his work on Native American history of the greater Yellowstone region. For example, he's co-author with Peter Nabokov of Restoring a Presence, American Indians in Yellowstone National Park, uh, of Mountain Spirit, the Sheep Eater, Eater Indians of Yellowstone, and with Dr. Julie Francis, Ancient Visions, Petroglyphs, and Pictographs of Wind River in Bighorn Country. We're th really thrilled to have him here today. Please welcome Dr. Lawrence Larry Lowendorf. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Bonnie. Can you hear me all right? If I get talking, can you? All right, good. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. At, uh, I always enjoy coming back to the museum to give talks. And uh, my topic today, Birds of Power, so we'll have to kind of take it on here with uh, one at a time uh, and talk a little bit about birds. Before I get going, though, I, I need to introduce you to a little bit of technology, and that is this new uh, thing software called D-Stretch, and uh, it, it's extremely important. We can actually put it on uh, some cameras that we can take into the field with us, or we can simply use digital images and then uh, take them into the, and put them on our computer and then look at the digital images with this D-Stretch. And the reason I bring it up is, is that we're able to return to sites 
now that we've been at before that other people have been at and we can see new things and so that's part of why I can talk about some of the things that I can talk about because we're seeing completely different things than we used to before so that for example do you see that pictograph that you see right there okay you see it right that sort of red pictograph in the center this is what we see with D-stretch so that gives you some idea of the advantages that we have when we use this technology and we use these cameras, we're finding paintings in places where you can't see anything at all on the wall. We'll be at a site and we'll wander along and find something totally new that we had no idea was there. And of course, this is adding tremendously to our database and our knowledge that we have about certain areas. I'm gonna talk about birds of power, but first we need to introduce ourselves to a model sort of, and this is the, the uh, Yi Fu Tuan model. He was a cultural geographer who spent most of his career at the University of Minnesota. In fact, there may be some in here who took classes from him. Uh, I, I heard him lecture one time. He was an incredibly brilliant man. But the whole thing is, is that re really a rather simple model. But the thing is, he talked about the fact that you had this world that was sort of where you could look at what you know in the known world so you had this, the objective world, the places that you could see and understand so that you could look into the sky, you could look below you, or you could understand those things that were in two directions of space from you. And then you had this kind of mythical world or this world out there where you didn't know things. So way up in the sky, what was up in the sky or down when you saw a whirlpool going down or down deep in a cave, those were mythical places and you created universes for those. You created the things that lived in those universes. People did this all over the world. I think this is a really good basic model for us to keep in mind when we record rock art sites, and I teach this to all students because I think they need to think about this whenever they go to a rock art site. And of course, I'm gonna talk about birds, which are gonna be in that upper part of this universe, but I'm also gonna bring it together with all the other parts of the universe as you go. I'm gonna start with a place called Picture Cave, which is on uh, Fort Bliss, which is near El Paso, Texas. You can see it's on the military base. And it's uh, the people who lived at Fort Bliss were lived in, uh, this is essentially the same time as the Anasazi or the, or the Hohokam people, the people who lived, they call them ancestral Pueblo people now, who lived in the Four Corners area. But in this part of the world, down in Texas, in this desert-like environment, they're called the Hornada Mugion people who lived there. And you can see the excavated house up above, that's the excavation that they lived in one story, kind of flat, sort of not built up with multiple stories and so, uh, th like they do in the four corners with houses built one on top of the other. But it's the same kind of an adobe construction. They also grew corn, beans, and squash, and so on, and, and, and practiced a, essentially a Pueblo uh, ideology. And so here is the Pueblo worldview. And this is essentially a take on what I just said, but a little better expanded. So that in essence, what happens here is that you have this power flow. And so the power goes and comes up in, in a Pueblo, it comes up in the Kiva, and it comes up inside the village in the Kiva, but it also goes underground and it comes out at various places, like it comes out at springs, it comes out at caves, and the whole idea, especially with these people who are involved in growing crops and corn, is to influence the clouds. You try to influence what's happening in the clouds so that you can get the clouds to produce rain for you. And interestingly enough, there's a motif that represents the clouds among these people. And if we take a look at the next one, you'll see here's that motif. See the top of the head here? That little stacked up thing like that is called a cloud terrace. And you'll see that that cloud terrace on the top of that has a face down below that. And that face would be a Kachina or a Katsina figure. And, and the Pueblo peoples believed that the Katsinas lived in the clouds. And so it was important for you to influence the Katsinas who lived in the clouds or at the tops of the mountains which were often shrouded in clouds. It was important for you to be able to influence them so that they would send the rain uh, down to earth. Okay, so following that kind of a model, you see here's another of those cloud terraces. And you'll see the cloud terrace has eyes in it. So in other words, we've got the Katsina represented by the cloud terrace. This represents lightning. 
coming off the sides of the cloud and rain coming out the bottom of the cloud, of this cloud terrace. And what sits at the top? A bird. A bird sits up at the top of this. Here the Tewa, which is one of the Pueblo languages, the word for a cloud is Aksuwa, and the word for a Katsina, or a Kachina as you're more used to hearing it, is Uxawa. So you can see that the two words are so close that they're blended together. They understood the clouds and the Kachinas to be the same thing so that they could get then the rain to come down from the clouds. Okay, we're going to talk about picture cave that I showed you there at the beginning. It's a limestone cave. The back wall is covered with paintings on one side of the wall. You can see here is one of these cloud terraces. There are a lot of birds. We think this might be uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, we're not sure, perhaps a roadrunner. We're not certain what that bird is. This one over here is a little easier to see. Here it is, and here's the de-stretch of it. It's a quail. So it's fairly easy to recognize what this bird is, an important bird to the, to the uh, Pueblo peoples who were there. But the, the painting, or the series of paintings that interested me the most in this cave were these, down this water streak right here. So and you'll discover that they're oriented vertically. They start at the top, and they come down like this, down the thing, down to the bottom. And they're almost completely covered by that stain of that water there. I saw that as important, like as sort of an idea that that's got something to do with bringing water. So what would the importance of those paintings behind that stain be? So we start with the top. Right up here at the top, this is our drawing of those paintings. And right up here at the top, we find a bird sitting at the very top of the thing, which I'm, we could almost predict based upon what I've already told you, right? Because birds should be at the top of the universe. They should be up in that very place where they would be at the very top. Interestingly enough, you can see this is that panel in the background. Here's the panel with the stain. And while we were working in this cave, doing the recording of these figures in the cave, we, at first, this thing sort of went by our feet. We are standing there, and we couldn't figure out what it was. We thought it was a mouse. We thought it was a rat. We didn't know what it was till it did it about two or three times, and we realized it was a bird. <laughs> and it was this little bird called a rock wren. And this little rock wren lives by flying into these caves, and he gets insects inside the caves, and then he flies out of the cave with this little insect. So in, in effect, you see, what we have here is a little bird, and what does that bird do? He goes to that underworld, he goes into that cave, and he flies out, and he goes up to those kachinas in the clouds. So he's taking a message. He's delivering a message from the underground all the way up to the kachinas up in that cloud. That's kind of cool, isn't it? He's still there. He's still flying there. Now, this in, in Europe, the fam this bird does this so much that the family name is trigloditity, and of course a triglodite is someone who lives in a cave, which is sort of interesting. This bird does this so much, flies into caves in its livelihood that it practices this little so on and so forth. So let's continue on down. Here's some rain lines coming down, and then we have this at the bottom here, which is a flower. And so you will learn that a flower represents the rejuvenation of all life, it refers to the flowery land where all good things originate. So not only do we have now, we have the bird, we have the rain, we have now the flower and the flowery world that's been created. So now we'll continue on down, and here comes the lightning. We'll see down here at the bottom. And so the lightning continues. Here are these cloud terraces. You'll see the bird at the top. Here's another cloud terrace with the plant down below. We've created the same universe then from the top with the bird, with the clouds, with the flowers that come down below the universe in the rock art that exists in that part of the world. And then we come, here's some of the pots from that area, and you'll notice that they have the clouds built into the sides of the pot so that they have the whole idea of that whole notion of bringing the water together to put their crops in. The whole thing is related, and all of this rock art is related to bringing rain, to getting the rain to come down from those kachinas up above. This particular figure right here is of some interest. It's down here below one of these cloud terraces, below some lightning that you see right here. But this figure right here, we think, in fact, might be a tadpole. And in fact, it might be related to the spadefoot toad. 
And you'll see here is another of these Zuni pots. Here's another um, medicine bowl that the Zuni made. And look here at these tadpoles that you see on the inside of it. That's because that spadefoot toad lives in the ground for up to as long as seven years until it rains. And then it comes out and it produces all of these offspring. So you've got all of the symbolism associated with the toads and their noise and the rain that's associated with it. Interestingly enough, these little toads, these little tadpoles, are trying to survive so much that they're cannibalistic. They eat each other in the process of trying to survive. There's a guy who wrote in, in uh, Scientific American, I took this offline, he bemoaned the fact that no one had taken a photograph of this, so he drew his own drawing of one of these little tadpoles, you know, eating the other tadpoles so that they could survive. Well, that was not lost on the people who did this rock art and who saw those little toads. This is at a separate site, but look at those teeth that are put into those tadpoles to let everybody know that these are vicious little things that will eat each other uh, in the process of, of, of uh, surviving and putting together there. So we put this entire thing together then from top to bottom. We've got at the bottom, we've got water and toads, and at the top, we've got birds. We got birds at the top and water and toads at the bottom. What does that tell us? That fits that universe together, doesn't it? It tells that story that goes then from sending the power symbol up to the clouds to bring it down to the underwater things that exist down below. It fits the model that Wei Tu Fuan told us, only in a little different way. I'm going to jump now to another site near Cuba, New Mexico. This is west of Albuquerque. And you'll see that here is David Brugge, who was the leading authority on the Navajo. He died about three years ago now. I was very, very fortunate to get to go out there with him uh, to this cave and for him to talk to me about it because this is a Navajo site now. We've moved away from the Pueblo and what's at this site is related to the Navajo. Just wait, I'm gonna get to Wyoming, okay? So we'll, we'll do some Wyoming in a minute, but I gotta do this stuff before I get here. All right, well, what's important is is that this cave has a spring in it. You'll see water in the background here. And here's the cave all the way up like that. Here's the water down here. This is a colleague of mine photographing on the top of a pole some of the things that are on the ceiling. What's on the ceiling are these stars. You'll see these little pluses almost universally. This represents a star, the plus does. So it's, these things are called star ceilings. There are about 50 of these different caves that the Navajo had and they put those stars up on the top of the ceiling of that cave so that they put all of those pluses up there on the top of the ceiling. And you can see from my scale up there that they're about four centimeters across. You'll also notice there are a whole bunch of mud balls up there. And for some reason or another, probably something to do with identification, they take some mud out of that spring and they throw it up to the ceiling to stick onto the ceiling. Of course, what are we doing? We're bringing together the water and the sky, when we pitch that up there, metaphorically, we're putting the two universes together. But of course, we also have birds up there. We have nice little birds painted on the ceiling and dragonflies painted up on the ceiling as well. Some of these ceilings are 35 feet off the floor and we have absolutely no idea how they painted these things up there. We think perhaps scaffolding was used, almost certainly. Someone had to have gotten up there on scaffolding to have put these little tiny paintings up on that ceiling. We do know the age. It's based on a date that was done on some of the organic matter in one of these mud balls and a corn cob that was found there. So it dates sometime in that AD 1500 to 1600 period of time, which fits perfectly with the Navajo and when the Navajo would have been in that region. So a pretty remarkable sight, is it not? With all of those figures painted like over 300 figures painted up on those two ceilings up above, the water down below and the ceiling and the sky up above. Okay, I got to Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna talk about Dinwiddie, of course, when I get to Wyoming, Dinwiddie rock art, which is that which is most common in the Bighorn Basin 
and that which I've probably spent the most time with. So I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some of the Dinwiddie rock art that I know something about or a little bit about. Uh, it, it is, uh, the principal site is, is uh, west of, in Dinwiddie Canyon, which is uh, near Lander, Wyoming, between Lander and Dubois, Wyoming, the Dinwiddie primary site or the type site for Dinwiddie. And the figures are scattered all through the Bighorn Basin all the way to south of Cody. Uh, Legend Rock has some at it and there are more out in the center. Legend Rock is a mixture of other things too, but there's a lot of Dinwiddie at Legend Rock. So there's a lot of Dinwiddie scattered around in, in the Bighorn Basin. And a little bit goes east of the Bighorn River, but by and large, you can see where it is, where I have the little arrow pointed into where it is in the center of the Bighorn Basin, uh, just to the south of us. And what I'm gonna say to you is in large measure coming from other people, I've put some parts into it, but a lot of what I'm saying comes from other individuals. Uh, Aki Hultkrantz was a Swedish anthropologist who studied the Wind River Shoshone, and they are actually the sheep eater Shoshone are the ones who did Dinwiddie rock art. And so it's the, he, he also, he, he spoke uh, Shoshone, and he, here he is on the left in about 1948 when he's with a Shoshone medicine man, Tootie Roberts. And on the right, uh, when I did the work in Yellowstone Park, we brought Aki Hultkrantz back over from Sweden, and we went up to Yellowstone Park, and here he is with Heyman Wise, uh, a Shoshone medicine person, so that, I mean, I'm, I'm using information from him, and I'm using a lot of information from Dmitry Shimkin and uh, Sven Javad and Robert Lowy, and then especially Judith Vander. So I'm pulling together other information. I'm trying to say I'm not making this stuff up. You know, in other words, I'm using what they what they have written, and I've sort of pulled together what they have written and sort of fitted my ideas to it with what they say. And one of the things that they all say is that the rock art in the Bighorn Basin was done in vision questing. It was done by individuals who went to these sites and sat and waited for a supernatural power to come. And then once they gained that supernatural power, it came important for them to put that power that they got on the rock so that they had to leave an image of what they had as their power and then revisit and pay tribute to that power that they left on the rock. So that, that if I, what I did was I went through all of those authors that I just saw right there and I kind of looked at, I divided them out into what the power animals were. And we have what they refer to, the Shoshone refer to as sky people uh, up at the top. And we have what are referred to as ground people uh, in the middle. And we have what are water or underground people uh, at the bottom. So this is our basic model again. This is the same model of sky people at the top and water people at the bottom. And at the very top, we have lightning and hummingbirds and so on. And so if we go, if we look at one of these sites, everyone, actually Aki Hulkrantz uh, went out to sites and, and they all said that this represents lightning. This coming down and we see a bird up here at the top. We see this lightning coming down from this bird, which is up at the top of this. So that's at the top of the universe up there that lightning, which is up at the top where the lightning comes from, and it's the most powerful thing that's in the top at the sky with lightning being associated. So this is the main Dinwoody site uh, on the Shoshone Reservation that you can go up to, and some of you may have been there, and you'll see it's fenced off now so that you can't get to the main panel at the site. But you can just start to look at the panel and you can instantly start to see that we have these various figures that have bird-like wings associated with them. Here are a couple beautiful examples. These probably represent eagles and they are uh, considered power animals at near the top uh, of the, the universe. Um, and they're in fact uh, large numbers of them. We're gonna jump now to the Ring Lake Ranch which is in the Dubois area where there is a lot of also uh, petroglyphs on the main ranch and also in the Turi Valley. There are large numbers of them. And here you see uh, Sharon Cahan beside this panel and behind her, you see this bird panel. So you'll see all of these sort of pendant wing figures that we have that we think represent eagles or birds like that. But then there's this interesting propeller wing like figure over here that we sort of sorted out might represent a hummingbird so that you have this sort of pendant wing figure and the propeller wing type figure. And so here we think because the wings are spinning so fast that it represents a hummingbird 
uh, with that wing kind of configuration that you see there. And you'll notice at the very top of all of these panels, the highest one of all of the panels, the one very up the very top is a hummingbird, one of these ones with propeller type wings. And what's coming out of the sides? Lightning. And what did we have at the top of our universe here? We had hummingbirds and lightning. So at the very top of this then, we have lightning and hummingbirds with the power coming down from the top with these birds. And here, owls become another powerful animal. The eyes are what give it away. See the eyes that you see there and even the beak that you see in this one that's been put into place. And then instantly you're going to ask me the question, how come it's got arms if it's an owl? And the answer is pretty simple. It's not a real owl. It's, <laughs> it's a cannibal owl. It's something that grabs you. It's part of that mythical universe that you make up for those things that are out there where you don't understand them. It's in that mythical space up there. It's the thing that creates the lightning. It's the thing that does these various things in the night. It's a bird that arrives fast in the night and silent, and it's hard to understand the bird. So you turn up and make these mythical things associated with that bird. It becomes a cannibal owl. Notice the feet, the three-toed feet. And in fact, when I counted the figures, not just the ones that were bird-like, in that area of the Torrey Valley, I counted the ones that had three talons on their hands or their feet. It's about 65% of the figures have those three talons. So it has very, very heavy bird imagery. What's important is, is that this is the highest elevation. You're over 7,000 feet. And that's where all of the bird imagery is, is up at that high elevation where you find the bird imagery. Look at that beautiful owl. Isn't that a wonderful piece of work? I don't have an actual photograph of that. That's across the Wind River, and you've got to wade the river to get to it. And uh, Linda Olson did this tracing. And uh, I, I don't have a photograph of the actual figure. I just have the tracing. But it's certainly an obviously recognizable as an owl. So if we go to the top of the pantheon then, the top of this world, we have these eagles, owls, and sky people up here. If we drop down to lower elevation, we get down to 5,500 feet or so, we end up with figures that are ground people, and a power animal is going to be a, a, a bear or an elk, another power animal. We know the least about this lower one this, uh, at the, this elevation because it's on the reservation. And, w and while there are some 20 or so sites, uh, rock art sites known on the reservation, they're not sort of in the public domain. And so we don't have a lot of understanding about what the figures are on this middle elevation, the ones that are uh, in the 5,500 to 6,000 feet. We know more about the ones that are up higher uh, at the 7,000 feet. And we know quite a bit about the ones that are down at the very bottom down here which are associated with the area around Thermopolis and in and south of Cody, Wyoming at the lowest elevation at somewhere around 4,500 feet in, in the Bighorn Basin. And we learn from the ethnography that the sheep eater Shoshone or the Shoshone believed that there was a creature called a, a water ghost that lived in the hot springs and that's what made the springs boil. That's what made them hot. And so we know about this water ghost type figure. And I had read a great deal about this water ghost figure. And we came to a site, this is now some 20 years ago, in Cold Draw, which is right about in the center of the Bighorn Basin, about as center as you can get north of Thermopolis. And you'll see we're in the process of tracing uh, off the figures at this site. And you'll see there are the figures that we're on in the process of tracing. And I had read about these water ghosts, and I had read that they were known to have very large hands. They used those hands to grab you with if you walked by. And so if you got too close to the water, they would grab you. And I got the bright idea that that might be water over their head that you saw. And the hands were sticking out of the water. And so I got the idea that these might represent these water ghosts uh, that you have. 
And so with that basis in mind, we kind of move through these. This is the Shoshone name for them, Pon Dezoovitz. So that you see Pon means water, Dezoovitz means ghost. So here's one of these water ghost figures then that's at the lowest elevation in this model that we have. So one of these figures is actually got female attributes and she was an especially bad, especially difficult figure to deal with. She would in fact not only grab you, but she would entice men by wailing at the water's edge. She couldn't come out of the water, but she would entice men by to come over to where she was and try to get them into the water on the promise of a sexual favor or something, and then she would drown them. And, and she had this very, I mean, in lots of ways, that drowning them is, is a metaphor for going into trance. You know, it's a metaphor for having a vision. But the whole thing is, is that she did, and she would grab children and bite their heads off and do all of these things. She was a very bad figure. But if you got her power, you became extremely capable, especially for healing. You could, in fact, in fact, if you got the power of any of these water ghosts, you could heal with it because you could, you had the ability to see into the body of a patient and you could learn where the evil thing that was making them sick was inside them. And then you could use a sucking tube to suck that thing out of them to get them and make them well again. Uh, once you got the power, here's the tracing of her. And you can see that she, she's about five feet tall when you stand next to her, Pawaip pretty impressive figure. We called this site the Amazon site because she had a bow in her hand and we could not understand that for a long period of time until we figured out who she was and she used that bow to shoot arrows into her victims. And it was those arrows that the medicine man who had her power could suck out to make people well again uh, from the inside. So here are her breasts which let us know that it's a female. It's unusual, highly unusual, uh, anywhere in North America to have a, a, a female breast shown on a petroglyph or a pictograph. But it's pretty obvious that that's what's represented here. And you can see the bow uh, in her hand here and a couple of arrows associated with it. We're not certain what this figure is here. It could be a child whose head she bit off, or it could also be a turtle because her assistant was the turtle and she would send the turtle out onto the land because she couldn't go out on the land. She would send the turtle out onto the land to do things for her. So here is next to her, a better turtle, which is a pretty well-made turtle, which was her assistant put there beside her. And another thing that's important about her is, is that you'll see that her foot is coming out of a crack right here. And in fact, it's believed that the area between Yellowstone Park and the Thermopolis Hot Springs had underground hot water that flowed back and forth between them. And when we look at where all of these water ghosts are, they're in that line, right in that corridor that goes between Yellowstone Park and Thermopolis. That's because they, at this point, were accessing her. She was underneath the ground there so that she was, when someone sat there and had that vision of her, she popped out at them and then they replaced her. She came out of that water that's underneath the ground and came up and then they replaced her at this location on the rock when they drew her and put her back to show what they'd had in their vision at this location. Next to her, which is a little bit hard to see, but you can see up here that there are a, here it is, there are a couple of frogs down here. That's to seal the fact that we now are underwater. You see, we have this whole underwater scene that's being put together here. Now at this location, which is very near where I just was, also in Cold Raw, there's a big, huge figure up on top of this. You'll see it's another one of these water ghosts. See, it's water over the top of it like this. It's big hands that stick out on the sides. It's got a bow in one hand and an arrow here that's used to shoot into victims. It's got a rattle that's associated. We now have found four of these water ghost women type figures and they all have rattles associated with them. And so we don't know quite what that is. And they also have amulets or arrows that hang on their sides 
uh, associated with this. But see that water that's associated? Well, at the base of this panel, George Frizen did an excavation, and he found right down in this area right in here, he found some 10 of these tubular sucking tubes. These are four of them. And what were those used for? Those were used to suck by the medicine person that evil thing, that arrow that's in the victims. They suck that out to make them whole again. So what's really interesting is that one of them has a design on it. And if we look at the design, it's water birds so that it's birds associated with either swan or geese. And the Shoshone considered birds, water birds, like ducks and geese, to be water people, not sky people. They fitted them with the water. We fit them with the sky. So it draws the entire thing together that we have the water at the bottom, the top, and th it's done in Wyoming on an elevation change. So we have the power animals in Wyoming, the birds and et cetera at the highest elevation, and we have the water and the things on the bottom at the lowest elevation. So if we follow the model, that basic model that I tried to introduce you to at the beginning, you can see then we do the same thing, the model that I think people should keep in mind when they work with these sorts of sites. So thank you very much for your attention. So.